I know you guys are used to checking out our van, but got a little treat for you today. I'm gonna show you Rob's rig right over there, and he can explain some of the crazy stuff that goes on with this four-wheel drive man truck. What's the process you go through when you start this rig? So from the start, the first really important thing, which I've taught Dan, hopefully, <laughs> is oil. The oil on that is perfect. I check the water level, so that. Yeah. So that's my coolant. I always isolate my battery, so then I'll switch the batteries on. So then, all the truck's live now. Plug this in, I've got a kill switch. Yeah. And then I have another little hidden kill switch. So now I switch on the TV. I've got a reversing camera. In with a key. With diesels you have heater plugs. So you let those heat up. When it's ready, you start the engine. I wait for the air pressure to build. I can let the brake off and I'm ready to go. So it just makes it very hard for anyone getting in the truck. They've got to know the whole system to start it. That's it. So for water, that's the water filler. So here is all, you know, oil and, you know, just junk. So that's another 40 litres of diesel. This is my grey water tank. So I wash the dishes while I have a shower. That water goes into here. So these are the domestic batteries. And uh, that is a small battery to power the lift at the back. This is my shore power, and then here is my mountain bike, EMTB. So in here is all my towing gear. So you know, great big thick towing straps. So here's the uh, garage. So down there are all the electrics, parts, uh, immersion heater for the hot water, gas bottles, tools, uh, my bed. So you can imagine, on a lovely evening on the beach, doors open, I'm in bed. This is hydraulic, so I press a button, this all lifts up, and then um, it makes it impossible to get in the back, and uh, obviously then I can drive along. So there's my generator. It's just a simple petrol, three and a half kilowatt generator. But here's the big tank. There's, here's the smaller tank. With those filled up, I could do about two and a half thousand kilometers. So I can almost cross a small country. So if the fuel in that country is expensive, I fill up before I cross, you know, the next place. Hey, look at this. <laughs> Thank you Love very it. much. <laughs> the two of these and the uh, four jerry cans around the corner are 570 liters. I've got fitted here a primary uh, fuel filter in a place like Africa or Central Asia, where the quality of the diesel's really bad. I would be changing this filter every week. The diesel could be black from old engine oil and, you know, don't even ask. So that is a primary which helps look after the main filters, which are around this side. We've got two, two main fuel filters. So those are big fellas. And that's really it. I've got a shower and I've got a toilet. Shower is here. So this is a real power shower because it's off the main electric pump, which gives a nice high pressure. That's hot and cold. So if I'm on the beach and covered in sand, I could just take this and shower outside. If it's private, I could just shower with the door open. And then I have a loo, which is here. So that's the, uh, it's a chemical loo. That slides out. And, um, that means I'm completely self-contained. Okay, no swearing, Danny. Tell me, Rob, how this beast was created. This is a 1986 MAN, which is Volkswagen uh, dump truck. And in year 2000, a German guy bought it, took the tipper off the back, sent the truck back to MAN, had it completely refurbished. Then put this living quarters on, which is a German Bundepost mobile office. Had it all kitted out. He went around the world in it came back, a Dutch guy bought it, 
completely had the whole thing rebuilt again. All the inside redone, rewired, regassed, replumbed, you name it. Him and his wife didn't like it, so I bought it. It's, it's four wheel drive, it'll drive in two wheel drive. And then all the controls for the four wheel drive are pneumatic. Press another button, that gives you longitudinal diff locks. Press another button, that's lateral diff locks. So when it's all locked up, you should be able to get out of anything. That's linked to Borg Warner gearboxes. You're the best German. So it's got 24 forward gears, four reverse. You know, it's got a pneumatic splitter on the gearbox. So it's like overdrive in every gear. The engine is a uh, diesel, six liter, straight six cylinder with a light pressure turbocharger on it. At altitude, the turbocharger gives you that compression to keep the power on. I bought it because there were no electronics on the engine. So if there's a problem in Africa, Asia, South America, you fix it with a hammer or a spanner. So these are really sought after because they're so easy to fix. Well, tell me about your electrical system. I have a separate electrical system to start the truck, a 24 volt, so each time I stop, I just isolate those. So when I'm running the engine, it also charges the domestic batteries. <laughs> so then when I stop, the solar panels are adding power to the uh, batteries. That's two ways. Then I have a, a petrol generator. About every fourth day, I'll hit the generator for six, seven, eight hours. That'll bring everything right up to tip top again. I've also can plug into electronic grid. You know, we call it a shoreline. That gives me instant power. That it's a sort of super booster to pick up the uh, World Wide Web. This is my uh, water tank domestic batteries. This is my diesel central heating. That's just to control the radio. It tells me how much gas is left in my gas propane bottles. That is gas powering to gas heat, water and gas central heating, which I don't use because that uses too much gas. I just use diesel. Uh, that is a immersion, electric immersion heater for my hot water. So that is absolute heaven. Inverter. So I press that button and it gives me 240 volts. A whole charging control panel really. And in the back, I've got computers that manage all the electrics for the whole truck. Rob has a history with boats. Well, always funny to hear you say like shore power, or provisions, those are boat words. So that would be starboard, this is port, that's the bow, that's the stern. <laughs> so you're kind of like us where, you know, using power to cook would take so much electricity, it's not very feasible. Because in here, are you running a propane system for cooking? I completely cook on gas. So I've got four gas rings, an oven, grill, that's all I use gas for. The same as with your truck, I've got Webasto central heating, mine's powered off diesel you have to have central heating because where we're going, it's going to get cold. So that's how you cook, but how do you refrigerate your food? So originally I had this fridge here, which is a sort of a small version of the domestic fridge you get in your house. It uses too much power. If the temperature is over 30 degrees C, about 85, 90 Fahrenheit, that just stops. I bought this in Australia actually, and I bought a cheap one, but this is a deep freeze, and that's a chiller. So it's about 50, 60 liter or whatever. So if I'm going really off grid, this is absolutely ram full of food. Because without a chiller, you, you know, you're really gonna struggle. Yeah. Particularly if there aren't many shops about. You know, some places you go for days and there's nowhere to buy food. In here, I've got all my, you know, cutlery and stuff. And then there's food and stuff. Then there's you know, more stuff. What about your water system? Do you have some filters or do you just get purified water? Yeah, I've got my ready water, hot and cold. I've got a twin sink, whatever you call it. I never buy bottled water. I don't like plastic bottles. I've got a 450 litre water tank. Where I fill that up with, I'm very careful. So what I do there is pour a glass of water out of the source that I'm gonna fill the tank from, smell it, take a good drink, leave it for 24 hours to see what happens to me. Wow. And if it's okay, I fill the tank. I put a chlorine-based additive in the tank. You know, make doubly sure two things are absolutely critical when you're traveling around the world. One is your health. If you lose your health, you're really in trouble. And if your truck loses its health, similarly, 
you know, you've got real problems. True. So you have to look after the spaceship and you look after you. I have got, you know, really special water filters. Very effective. It's a system straight off yachts. They do sort of block fairly quickly. Hmm. So I've taken them out. In Egypt, southern Egypt, I couldn't get any water, drinkable water anywhere. I went to a supermarket and ordered, I think it was 25 bottles of 20 litre. 25. You know, yeah, I think it's 20, 25, something like that. Oh. I mean, a truck came and delivered them. <laughs> and I got on the roof and siphoned the whole lot into the tank. So I just spent all day with a hose pop. And, um, you know, wow. then I was safe. Rob's been around the world in this rig. Can you explain uh, a little bit the route that you've taken? I'm a Welsh boy. So I started in the UK at my daughter's house, Chester, down through uh, Europe, east down through Croatia, the Dalmatian coast, absolutely beautiful. And then Greece, Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, a ship over the Caspian Sea to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all along the Afghan border, all the way up to the Chinese border. So that's the Pamir Highway, one of the five most dangerous roads in the world. I met the American Special Forces on that road, by the way. <laughs> up to the Chinese border, and then across to Kyrgyzstan, back into Kazakhstan. And then I was trying to get over the top of Afghanistan, because you can't go into Afghanistan. You couldn't then, and you can't now. I was trying to get across just into China, over into Pakistan, India, Nepal, and down to Singapore that way. but. Those borders were blocked because of political stuff. I had to come back to Greece. I had to drive for three weeks to get out of the Central Asian winter, which, you know, is literally a killer. And then to Greece, and then I shipped to uh, Egypt, and then drove down through Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa to Cape Town. That was all that. So then I shipped from Port Elizabeth in South Africa to Melbourne, Australia, went right around Australia and across the middle. I got caught in Australia when COVID hit, so that was a nice place to be actually. I was able to ship to Mexico. So now from Mexico down through all Central America down to Panama, shipped to Colombia, and now I'm heading south to Patagonia. Yeah, the very southern tip of South America, and then I'll go up to Uruguay, and then that's the easiest place to ship back to Europe. Wow, and that's the whole world? It'll take me five years, so I've been doing four years nearly now. Wow. Four years in June. So you've shipped multiple times now, and for us, we've only done once from Panama to Colombia. In our van, you can fit it in a container, so that cost 1800 for us. I was wondering how much it cost for you to ship. Well, first you said you crossed the Caspian Sea. Is that just a ferry? That was an old Russian ship. I mean, just, it was a, on this ship, it actually took trains. So it had railway lines. So they pulled trains in it, big trucks, my truck, there were other travelers. The people on it, we had a good laugh. I think that was, actually, that was expensive. It took 36, 48 hours. Whoa. I think it was about 500 US. Okay. And it was a very corrupt, buying the ticket was corrupt. That seems like a fair price for such a long boat ride. Yeah, I suppose so, but you didn't see the boat. The next ship he was from Greece to Egypt. So that was using Grimaldi, which is an Italian roll-on, roll-off, because this, this won't go in a container. It has to go on a roll-on, roll-off. And those are those big, ugly, square ships full of brand new cars. They hold about 8,000 cars and me. I would say that was in US dollars, probably about 3,500. The Egyptian port's a nightmare. So the 3,500 US includes port fees and add-ons and turning dollars into documents. I think is the best way to, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. But it gets you out. So then from Cape Town to Australia was including all port fees, agents, fixers, Fixes being people who help you with the port and customs, 5,000 US, something like that, five, 6,000. Wow, that's really for a far. big trip. Shipping is like witchcraft, because I've got a spreadsheet that shows dollars per sea mile, mm. and it just doesn't calculate. <laughs> I would always get about 15 quotes, and it'll still be for the four same ships. Uh, and the prices will vary from 15,000 US dollars to 6,000 for the same service. You have to work. Yeah, thanks for having me in your house here. So we did the measurements and it's actually 15 feet long by eight feet wide, 120 square feet of living space in here and a six foot three inch clearance for your head. So this thing seems plenty big to go around the world in. 
But what was your reason for taking off and why are you on the road? I mean, I started thinking about this uh, when I was aged about 40. You know, my life was really the same as everybody else's. I was very lucky, I had a fabulous childhood. I did fine at school, didn't particularly enjoy it, but I did what I had to do. And I went to university, I didn't enjoy that. So I left <laughs> at the end of the first year and I went into my career. I sailed a lot, uh, skied, I travelled, uh, you know, a lot, but only on holidays, you know, in the UK we get 30 days holiday a year. Nice. So, you know, I was doing three weeks of this and two weeks of that. So, you know, we were getting around with my wife and then our daughter, but I was quietly thinking that, you know, pals of mine, after they'd done uni, you know, they'd done some serious travelling. Well, I had I'd seen all these documentaries on TV about Africa or America or, you know, you name it. So when I was about 60 odd, so we sold the family house, business, sailing boat, cars, you know, you name it, we just sold everything. So my wife and daughter were able to have a buy a house. I just picked that opportunity. I thought if I'm going to go around the world, yeah. it's now. Wow. So I found this truck. And off I went. So far, I'm glad I did it because yeah. I'm still alive, you know, and I've still got my health. <laughs> there you go. You know, you need to be thinking, you've got to be on the ball, you've got to look after yourself, and you need a bit of luck. In your trip around the world, what's been your favorite spot on each continent? Turkey was really surprised how just how hospitable, how hospitable the Turks were. What a fantastic country it is. I mean, it's huge. And then in Central Asia, um, Tajikistan is just stunning. Go down through Africa, Botswana or Namibia or, you know, sort of around that area was pretty nice. Australia is Australia. Expensive, but it's a fantastic place. Central America, Guatemala, South America, we're in South America, so it's too early to say. Although I did like Colombia, so, you know, it's difficult to say though, isn't it? Huge thanks to Rob for inviting us all into his home and telling us a bit of his life. Let us know what you thought of this big rig tour in the comments. If you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe and ring the bell. And for some exclusive updates, check out our Patreon and join the family. Thanks so much for watching as always, and we'll see you next time.